And welcome everyone. My name is Marcy Peterson. I'm the Marketing Technology Director at Wheaton Arts. And um, welcome to this evening's Wheaton Conversation with David King and David Schnuckel. Um, I also wanted to take a moment quickly to remind you that there are three great ways to support Wheaton Arts and this free programming, and that is um, membership. Uh, which gets you free admission and some great benefits throughout the year, donations, and my favorite shop, WheatonArts.org. The Wheaton Conversations have continued in 2021 and will continue, um, but we have just one more before we take a break for the summertime. Um, and on June 24th, we welcome Judith Schechter and Jeff Zimmer to the program. Um, Jeff Zimmer and Judith Schechter have been friends for almost 20 years. They will discuss their common themes of their work, their process, and how they see themselves as artists through social issues, identity, inspiration, and darkness. And now my co-worker and your host, Pamela Wakeman, is the Director of Education and Artist Services at Wheaton Arts, um, is going to be your moderator for the evening. And Pam, over to you. Hi, everybody. Marcy, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure to be here with you again this evening. I see some familiar names there. And I'm so happy that you're continuing to join us until the end of this kind of season of our program. I would love to introduce our guests for this evening. Both of them have been Creative Glass Center of America um, fellowship recipients. So I have gotten to see them work in our studio and it's great to have them joining us here together to talk about um, some really fantastic things that they're, that they're doing. Our first guest is David King. David is a visual artist who works with glass, found materials, glue, and gumption. He earned an MFA from Tyler School of Art and has a BFA from The Ohio State University. He makes objects, installations, and drawings that address the transiency of perception. King is a founding member of the artist collective Flock the Optic, who combine glass blowing with interactive installations, sound manipulation and relational interventions. You may have seen some of Flock the Optic's work on the Wheaton campuses if you were so lucky. He has taught at several academic institutions and craft workshops and is currently an assistant professor of art at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. Thank you so much, David, for being here. Our next guest is David Schnuckel. David is an artist who works extends from committed relationship with glass and whose ideas dwell at the intersection of control and chance. As a writer, he examines aspects of his making and teaching practice at a blog called David Schnuckel Uses His Words and is a regular contributor to Gas News, the newsletter of the Glass Art Society. Schnuckel is an assistant professor of glass in the School for American Crafts at Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Thank you both for being with us here this evening. I'm so excited to get into our program. Thanks so, thanks so much, Pam. We, uh, we really appreciate the invitation. I know, um, you know, when I heard about it and started communicating with David, we were, um, we just fe felt like this was a, a perfect opportunity. We've, we've been friends for probably 10 years now. And, um, and uh, I think it's a, the, the opportunity to sort of like, Look at your own practice through the lens of somebody else's practice is, is a perfect activity. And, um, and again, I, I just like to express that I, I'm so, so grateful to Wheaton um, for, for all the opportunities to, to work and sort of be associated with that institution. And, um, and to you, Pam, and to Marcy for helping to set this up. And to you, David, to agreeing to do this. So let's, let's hope it um, goes well. Yeah, what could go wrong? <laughs> that There's still time. We just yeah. started. But I agree. I am very thankful as well. Thank you, Pam and Marcy and to Wheaton and uh, David. This has been fun to connect with you in this way. Uh, we've been preparing, not preparing, but we've been kind of um, uh, connecting with one another about this since um, maybe late March. I can't really recall, but it's been nice to use this as an excuse to touch base a little more often than we normally would. So um, uh, it's been really fun for me to reconnect with you and to spend time online in this way. So um, the other thing that David and I both were really excited about um, in taking part in this is that the Wheat Conversations thing proves to be uh, no joke. Um, and they ask some really, really um, special people. And so for us to be 
included in that roster uh, is, is really humbling. So David and I have not taken this lightly. So thanks again, Marcy, Pam, and Wheaton for this, this moment. Um, David, do you want to kind of outline how we're thinking about tonight? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we really were hoping to honor the title uh, and, and keep this as conversational as possible. We do have a bit of a structure. Um, we're, we're each going to introduce our work, um, which will look a little bit like a, you know, a slide lecture, but we're, we're going to keep it pretty brief about maybe five, five or to eight minutes, let's say each. And, um, and then, and then we have a series of questions that we've kind of prepared for each other, but we're hoping that, um, you know, other questions come up in the chat and that other sort of lines of conversation, um, enter and exit and, um, and we can kind of uh, replicate a little bit of what it's like to be on a on a phone call or a person to person meeting between the two of us when we when we really get going and get excited about about what each other are doing and what what we're up to. So um, so we're hoping we're hoping we see a bit of that today. Yeah. And I might even add, you know, um, if if folks feel interested enough. Um, uh, do feel free to hit us up uh, afterwards um, when this is all said and done. You're going to get quite a bit of um, information about where to find us online and how to get a hold of us. So um, in case that's of interest, uh, we're, we're not inaccessible. We'd be happy to continue the chat with you afterwards if you'd like in uh, other ways. Absolutely. Um, so I think I think that maybe is good, a little bit of good foundation. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm first up for my little introduction. Um, so again, my name is David King, um, and I'll just we'll get right into it. Um, I just started, I decided to start with this image. Um, it, I think it uh, expresses uh, who I am as a maker in a lot of different ways. It's also a very um, a transformational moment in my practice. So. Um, you know, th this sort of uh, emphasis on precision or rigorous labor, um, an interest in the vessel, um, historically manufactured objects, all, all of that is sort of wrapped up, I think, in, in this one piece. Um, but this is also my realization about a couple of things, one being that, um, that this common uh, disposable object, when such close attention is paid to it, it, it uh, gain this sort of transcendent um, aura, this a little bit more power. So I've I paid close attention to that. And then also even just the way this is documented, the fact that it's in a hand, it's being activated is something that um, comes up a lot in trying to invite people in to participate somehow with, um, with what I've experienced as a maker. Um, this is another transformative moment, um, leads to a long line of inquiry a bit of an experiment prompted by a question, let's say a question from a, a professor I was working with at the time about um, color, use, the use of color in my artwork. And there's a bit of a, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, in academia, sort of a purity to using clear exclusively. And I thought it might be, um, you know, clever, hopefully not to an obnoxious de degree to try to make something colorful with clear glass exposing um, another layer of transparency, sort of an honesty about the material. So by making this prism out of sheet glass, seeing um, this strongly projected um, refraction of the full spectrum of, of light, um, this materialized into several different things. One of them was this portrait of Gerta, um, who among many, many other things was responsible for a very important um, uh, piece of writing on color, the theory of colors, and first really to unpack the psychological effects of color. Um, developing, materializing my own color systems, this one based on the Gerta's uh, six, six hue color system but thinking about systems, also thinking about glass as, as this medium to transmit, distort, um, obscure. Um, you also see here I'm collecting um, materials from the recycling bin. So this, this interest in color and working with this found source of color from the sky, 
um, also looking in my own environment for, for color about. This is um, an attempt a couple of years later, a, a kind of an inversion of um, what was happening with, with white light turning into uh, the full spectrum. These, this collected trash at the bottom of the left screen is reflected up into a circle of mirrors, which is then distorted through a camera projected back across the room. Um, a little convoluted, you'll see that in, in a, several of the other projects coming up. Um, again, I might mention this, this idea of rigor and, and maybe taking it a little bit too far and, and seeing where those limits are. Um, but the other thing that I think is important about this is again, this invitation for the, for the viewer to enter the space somehow, um, sort of be exposed to the mechanics of this information being communicated somehow as seemingly irrelevant as it is. Um, so kind of on that note, this is another project utilizing technology, the camera technology. In this case, I was looking at historical examples of early proto, um, proto cinematic devices. This is, this is a zoetrope. Um, an early example of a zoetrope was used for, um, by Edward Moybridge in order to, um, in order to show some of um, his early experiments in animal locomotion. This project was prompted by thinking about Moybridge, but also thinking about um, or, or being exposed to this video that I found online of this little kitten trying futilely to run up a plastic slide. Um, so here, this is the Moybridge source image. Uh, this is uh, trying, attempting to confirm that uh, horses' hooves leave the ground completely during a gallop. Um, and he was, um, and this again was a sort of transitional, transformative moment in um, early, early film. You know, uh, one of the things about the filming, the film process is that it's a cycle that it's um, and, and that that object itself, it's, it's just sort of this repetitive, um, repetitive action, looking at the difference between um, early cinematic and, uh, you know, very recent um, looping animations and kind of, you know, drawing this parallel, uh, avoiding value statements about progress. Um, and, um, and, you know, again, trying to tie that maybe into other um, systems of science, uh, such as color evaluation, color systems, um, and trying my best to subvert that in some sort of way. Look at, um, look at the fact that, you know, both scientists and artists have been trying to come up with a comprehensive way of organizing color, um, but neither, um, have really achieved such. So it's it's this interesting intersection of of science and art, and um, and maybe a, a instance where art has a little bit of the edge. Um, but you know, these last couple slides are just really um, an introduction of a a mode of working with material of of in the first case sheet glass, and now here blown glass to to encapsulate these objects. Maybe a little callback to that um, that beer bottle and um, and thinking about how materializing it with this craft gesture gave it this um, outsourced uh, or sort of um, outsized um, relevance or or seeming uh, importance just just based on its um, the way it's treated or the mode of its display so so that's that kind of subversion or um, or um, extension of, of our, our, our value system is, is one of the things that I'm, um, I think I'm most interested here, although it's really open to interpretation. I'm, I'm curious to hear what David thinks about this work eventually. And um, I think on that note, that is, that's the last thing I'm gonna show, show to you at the moment. Um, you can find a lot more projects, maybe a little clearer explanation of some of the projects on my website. Um, and I have an Instagram at see through art. You can check me out there and, uh, really do invite anybody to reach out at my email address as well. Um, which is pretty readily available. And then with that, David, I think I'm going to pass it off to you. David, thanks for, for that. And, uh, 
uh, yeah, the, the video that didn't play, it's amazing. We've gone through this a few times. And for those of you who are not familiar with that work, please do go to David's website because it's, it's an astonishing uh, laborious work that really demands your, your full attention. I, I love that piece. I, I hope we do get to talk about it some more. Um, a couple things about me before we get going. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. And I'd like to acknowledge the longstanding history of the land of the Haudenosaunee that I currently inhabit, what we currently refer to as Rochester, New York, and that is where I'm coming to you from tonight. Um, what I'd like to present you all with is a five minute effort to briefly contextualize the basic cornerstones of what I do, told in four very short chapters. Uh, we wanted to keep this front end brief so that we could have a little bit more of a chit chat and I'll identify these along the way. So let's start. Chapter one, Vessel Origins. Uh, I do refer to myself as an artist, but I also recognize that um, a lot of the practice extends from being primarily a glass blower. And my work has mostly extended in one way or another from vessel making, vessel history, um, vessel theory. And here are some early examples of that. And the work that I do now is very different, but the tie that binds has always been an acknowledging a relationship to glass that's been built on really obsessive tendencies and a need for precision and a need for control, but those things as uh, a vehicle for uh, navigating conflicting sensations of flaw and fault and failure. Um, things like skill acquisition and symmetry and graceful movements and craftsmanship, these are sort of vessel-based benchmarks that clinched my devotion to the hot shop so many years ago. Um, and they're the ones that I'm currently rethinking in a broader, more experimental way. And uh, in turn, I'm relying on one of the most uh, iconic vessel motifs within the glass catalog as a tool for a kind of subversion against itself. And as well, the, the myths of magnificence that it has kind of stood for, for me, and perhaps even to um, the glass culture at large. Um, which is fed into a practice not in service to mastery, but uh, masterful efforts to dwell in error, compromise, and the mishap. And we just saw a picture of Dr. Jane Cook, who's here tonight, who's been a, a, a trustworthy friend and colleague in this sort of exploration from time to time. Chapter two, chapter two already, glass as a making language system. So here's something that has been overheard. Um, if you have no technique, you have no language. If you have no language, you cannot speak. And so this connecting of two seemingly unrelated dots uh, is what the work that I do, it's what it's prompted by. It's one of thinking about the parallels between glass working and language. It's a place where things like um, grammar and syntax and the mechanics of making and of being at the bench kind of serve as uh, like a linguistical thing of its own. So things like skill acquisition and hotshot process as it relates to language structure and coherency is coupled with an interest in researching instances where word systems get a little weird when they kind of come undone. Uh, I kind of use this umbrella term, abstracted language phenomenon, to describe things I'm interested in, like various speaking disorders and how that sort of informs how I might turn my glass process upside down, um, abstractions of um, the vocal, uh, uh, sort of uh, abstractions of the spoken word, uh, and of course, abstractions to the written word. Um, all of these inform a way of turning tradition and technique uh, of language usage sort of upside down. And so um, the mishandling of words and the process of using them are informing me on how to go about mishandling glass and the process of working it. And I think of ways in which glass goes wrong. The things that we were trained to avoid when working with it and how I could use advanced glass object making processes to sort of go there, to intentionally go to those places of wrongness and uh, go there in also advanced ways. So the work that I'm currently doing is set in motion by a really simple question, at least at the very beginning. How can I break something down 
as thoughtfully and as skillfully as I have originally built it up. And that leads us to chapter three, things and thoughts. So let's look at a few projects that do that in a real fast and furious way. Sometimes I talk about the work that I do as exploring a place where skill and surrender cross over. Sometimes I talk about it as um, starting in this place of observation, uh, like a surveillance of, of futility cycles of error. Um, and then I try to figure out a way to pull some sort of art idea or two or six out of it. Uh, sometimes I talk about the work as being a part of an experimental craft practice, a sort of media specific, process specific, anti process kind of thinking, which is a lot of, you know, it's very muddy. I'm still working the language out on that, but that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, partially. Sometimes I talk about the work as being interested in locating ways in which human vulnerability parallels with material vulnerabilities, especially ones that are unique to glass. Uh, and sometimes I talk about the work as uh, an effort to honor irony. Uh, and like this, for instance, belongs to a body of work that aims to make a singular, very simple object composed of many, many complicated and smaller ones. And then sometimes I talk about the work as an effort to commemorate processes unseen within our process, things that are sort of um, overlooked and left behind, uh, given a moment to be acknowledged, recognized, uh, given new life. And then here's another ongoing project that catalogs that sort of impulse in a different way. Chapter four, last chapter, called homework. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that David had mentioned that I would as, uh, also wanting to mention is that, you know, it might be of interest to maybe open a separate tab where our websites uh, might be something that you kind of use to look at as we chat. And uh, maybe that might sort of fill in some visual background as we talk about various things, but also maybe, um, uh, maybe using your phone or firing up another tab to pull up our various uh, Instagram platforms to get a more behind the scenes look in case some of these places um, provide things that you might want to put forward as questions later on. And uh, I think that that's where I wanted to sort of build towards just to provide a real brief sort of glimpse into who I am and what I'm doing and how those things might um, kind of cross over with some of the things that David does and what he's interested in, how he's wired. So I think it's at this point that we're going to hand it over to Pam and um, do some sort of preliminary sort of question and answer just in terms of what we do individually and maybe find connectivity there. Sure. Thanks so much, guys. That was a great introduction. Um, to the audience, if you guys have any questions, again, please feel free to put them in the q and I'll be monitoring that from now until the end. Um, David King, um, this question is um, kind of an introductory question into what you were speaking about specifically when you were talking about um, when you started using kind of this visual perception and, and using clear glass to show um, a, a prism of colors. So your work I, that I have experienced is specifically the stuff at Wheaton that I've seen, it kind of exists within this intersection of science and glass. And you kind of mentioned that briefly. When did that interest in those scientific concepts happen? Like what led you to that? You mentioned the professor nudging you, um, but was it that or was there always this underlying interest that science kind of entered into your glass making? Hmm. Um, you know, I, looking back, I, I feel like that that was the moment where I began approaching it as as uh, as more of a research project in that sense. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I mean, part of the prompt was it was it's graduate school. So there you feel like there needs this to be this additional layer. And um, and but for me, it was it's a search. It's not like I have this figured out or I know exactly what I want to say. It's more um, let me find out what the material is saying. Um, so in that way, I think it really just sort of fell in line with the scientific method. Um, and um, and then you know color. I think when when color became the focus, um, that was the thing that 
that that sort of um, you know interests me on top of everything was that you know scientists had an interest in sort of defining color and of course artists do as well and that um, it is the shorthand for um, the problem with perception, right? It's like, how do we know we see the same color blue in the sky? So it, it, is, a, it is, you know, a cliche in a sense. And, and I've found myself attracted again and again to like, um, you know, these cliches and because I feel like that's um, another thorough challenge to sort of take that on and, and make, um, make something um, unexpected from it, you know, um, not saying here's just what, um, uh, parroting back what what is already out there but finding a unique angle so I think it's a yeah so I think it is a combination and and, and you know I know there's scientists out there I mean my dad is here and he'll want me to say that you know I come from a family of people who are um, interested and involved in science and him being primary in my life and so you know I think either that was baked in or um you know, I was thinking about it relationally, like I'm an artist and, you know, my sister studied science, my dad studied science. Um, and obviously there's a crossover with the material too. So it just felt intuitive, I think. Fantastic. Um, David Schnuckel. So you, from what I see, can use, use glass as this catalyst or rather an avenue to express thoughts about the human experience. And in this tonight, we're specifically talking language. Um, what originally led you to choose glass as that medium to accomplish the communication of those thoughts? Is it like what David had said? Did it just kind of fall into place or was it um, this conscious choice that you said, okay, this is the medium I'm using to communicate that? I think in my case, it was a matter of just, um, uh, just I'm, I'm a big fan of, of when artists connect really um, interesting dots between the things that they're interested in. And the sort of more disparate those points are, the more kind of unlikely that they would be, the more stranger the bedfellows are. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the sort of more interesting kind of ways in, in shaking a new understanding or a new realization or a new possibility out of both of those things can kind of lead to. So um, for me, I, I had um, actually been very interested in leaving the hot shop behind um, uh, maybe several years ago, um, because uh, I, I just it just came to a point where I recognized that blowing glass was fun, but it didn't seem to be helping me answer any sort of curiosities at that point. Um, and and then when I started to kind of really teach, uh, get a little bit more serious or deeper into the waters of of academia and teaching glass and teaching process. Um, the idea of communication became like so obviously parallel to um, not just um, not just in terms of being an educator and and the process of learning and absorbing what's being given, but also the notion of like communication between maker and material. Like there is a conversation, uh, even though that sounds kind of hack and cliche. I always believe that there's uh, a call and response. But then also thinking about the fact that I, I I'm not. Um, I do write a lot and I do publish writing a lot. I'm, I'm an amateur, but um, I do find it to be very fulfilling and rewarding in a lot of different ways that we, we might get into later on tonight. But um, uh, just, just kind of recognizing the way in which I've approached process as a sort of sequential thing and it's got a grammar and a syntax and a sequence to things and just recognizing that the way I've approached uh, blowing glass in particular had such a logical structure to it. And then um, once I kind of saw that, I'm very interested in things that um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of uh, bound by logic and control, but I'm so fascinated by um, when things kind of go upside down and uh, inside out and sideways. And, and so kind of finding ways in which words, whether spoken or written, um, become like less coherent in a very literal way, but um, perhaps uh, very articulate in a very figurative way. Uh, that's, that's kind of um, where my interest in glass and language is kind of living right now. So thinking about it as a, as a sort of logical sort of method of, uh, of, of making, uh, and then uh, how that might turn upside down and, and sort of speak to something that's perhaps even more interesting. And especially with someone like me, who's kind of fascinated in the myth of mastery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's been such a, um, uh, I've dwelled so much in how that might 
kind of live as a sort of idealistic sort of framework. And I, you know, once you kind of get to a certain point as a technician, you start rethinking what you thought you knew so well. And then all of a sudden kind of um, uh, thinking about turning the notion of mastery inside out, um, how rightness, uh, excellence and rightness can turn into an excellence and wrongness to kind of kind of led me to those kind of abstracted language phenomena. So just trying to merge two very dissimilar things and, and trying to create a sort of new logic in that sort of ambiguity is, um, it's probably a lot to do with it for me. Thank you. Well, I will hand it back to the two of you. Cool, thanks, Pam. Yeah, thanks, Pam. This is the part of the night where David and I wanted to sort of have a little bit of back and forth with one another and um, kind of identifying parallels between us and wanting to identify what those are and, and maybe ask each other about that. And what we did is we kind of pulled up images of each other's work to kind of help bring us to that place. So we're, we'll try this. So I pulled three images of, of work that um, I see a sort of tie that binds. And one of the things that I know that we have in common is the inclusion of the vessel as a sort of platform to, to um, figuratively uh, and literally, but figuratively hold content. And so for me, it's obviously been a very reliant starting point in each project that I do and the kind of vessel that I use has always been a very specific kind. But for you, what I really appreciate is that the vessel has been activated in a few different ways. So there's the bottle form, which by the way, there's this is just a, a excerpt of a larger work that demands so much more attention than this. Um, and, and, and then uh, there is uh, the sort of assemblage of, of a geometric form or a box. And then on the right, you talked a little bit about uh, one version of the optical instrument that I kind of see as a, as a container of light and color and optics. So some of these are very much on the nose when we as glass folks think about what the vessel is usually associated with. And some of these are less obvious. So um, I, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about what these different relationships to the vessel structure kind of share in your thinking and where they might kind of deviate. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. Um, no, it's a it's a good point of entry, and um, and uh, you know I don't know if I would have um, set that frame on myself in terms of thinking about these projects, but I, I I've liked the I've liked sort of um, trying, and um, I mean a few things I'll say which I think you know uh, will be reiterated, and and I think you've already you talked about in your introduction is you know just a, a real love for making things and blowing glass and blowing glass on center and you know um it's it's just given i think uh, some of us can relate the two of us can certainly relate in that way um and and there is something to making a vessel a vessel is um it's a relatively efficient thing to make it's it's uh, something you do repetitively you get slightly better at it and then you have like these terrible failures and you think you're awful and you should never, you know, ever attempt to do it again. But, um, but, you know, you work through that and there's, and there's this level of satisfaction um, and sort of controlling this material that is, um, you know, uh, truthfully, there's some, it's justifying repeating that for some reason. You know, I just happen to also be really interested in art so, you know, that's where I apply it. And, um, and in this case, you know, I think wanting to be a thoughtful artist, um, I, you know, do the minimal amount of research to try to get to the source of, of uh, the tradition of some of these practices. And I think when the three you brought up, you know, the bottle as a, as a manufactured object, um, either manufactured by hand for a long time, now automated, maybe somewhere in between through a transition, not a little bit this project, but other projects have tried to address that to some degree or reflect that, that history a bit. Um, and then the middle image, uh, you know, these are, these are panes of window glass. Uh, this is essentially a very fancy display cabinet. Um, so, you know, thinking about a window or something architectural and then, um, and then the last one, these are, these are lenses. This is, this is scientific equipment. 
Um, this is to um, alter vision, to enhance vision, to um, to to highlight something, um, you know, uh, optical phenomena for for all for all its worth. Um, I think the way in which they all function. Um, uh, um, as glass, and this is special to the nature of the glass, but also to all those those sort of subsets of, of um, vessels, if you will, is that they they serve something. They they are subservient to to other things. You know, the vessel, the bottle holds uh, something and, and helps transport it, helps deliver it. Um, the window, you know, is is functional, but it's not the structure of the building. Um, it's it, you know, it's it's allowing observation of whatever is beyond it, and the lens is you know again about extending vision. And it's it's more about the thing that you're looking at it. So, so you know, I think that um, the 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 answer is kind of a we'll break it down in two parts. It's you know a love for for the challenge of making these things because glass is a is a precocious material to work with, um, but also. Um, once sort of getting a little bit under the surface and, and thinking about what these things are and what they, how they function historically, the fact that they are um, uh, uh, amazing, but, but kind of seen through, like uh, underappreciated to some, to some degree. Um, so I liked, uh, I liked the, the opportunity to, to look at, look at the, the communication device a little bit more, um, you know, to, to turn it back on itself a bit. And that's, that's what I think all of these things are doing to some degree. You know, and, and looking at this, I don't really have a question, but I just, uh, an observation that I've had just kind of like thinking about you a lot over the past few weeks and kind of dwelling in, in the work that you've been doing. I, I just noticing something here that, um, I'm just noticing for the first time, and it's and it's something that I think is consistent in a lot of other work that you do too. It's just like there's like this really interesting sort of circular orientation to how to how things either live or how they're brought to life. Um, the bottle's the one that I'm as a one glass blower to another. I know that the idea of keeping things on center and the idea of rotation is a more kind of circular part of the process, but. Um, you know, I really love how that circular kind of thinking lives, not only in the cabinet, but in um, the horizon study, but even in other sort of bodily movements you've made with them. Um, I can't remember, like, obviously, the Sisyphus is happening that way, too. But even the idea of like walking around uh, with that push cart and the television. Um, I, yeah, I'm just kind of noticing that for the first time, even though I've been spending so much so many minutes with your work. <laughs> is that something that's part of anything for you? Or is that just kind of happenstance? Um, I, I think, you know, I think it to some degree it is intuitive. But, um, but you know, I think it's, uh, and, and I, you know, I see this in you as well. Um, maybe not so much the visual symbol of it, but, um, but, you know, a desire to be sort of comprehensive in a sense is like, to like, um, you know, I mean, that's, I think that's why the, the spectrum really appealed to me. It, it like, not only it kind of like within it, everything was encapsulated, um, but it, it connected back around to itself. Um, so um, yeah, I think there's something clean and, um, and there's just something really clean about that, um, that, that I find attractive. And, um, and I think in the process of making decisions, it's one of those things that you find yourself coming back and making, you know, the a similar decision because, you know, you are the artist, designer, maker that you are. I'll, I'll chalk it up to that. It's not intentional, I don't think. Yeah, I, I think that's so cool. It makes me think of, um, I talk about with students how, like, as artists, we all have a sort of fingerprint. Like, they're just things that kind of happen, uh, like just intuitive patterns that kind of keep on surfacing in the way that things live or how things are produced. And that's that's one of the things I really, one of the consistencies about you that I just really am fascinated by. I think it's, yeah, I, I wish I had that. <laughs> well, let's let's see if we can find your your version of that. All right.
And David, you know, um, you know, in thinking about our sensibilities and, and how they're similar, um, you know, I think I both, you know, see resonance and then I also see things that you're up to that I'm like, I'm like, gosh, I wish I, I had that. I'm a little envious or, um, or you know, uh, so in this, this piece that I'm bringing up called Withdrawals, I really love and um, I, uh, I see some of my similar instincts in it in this sort of iterative process, you know, sort of having, so folks maybe um, if you haven't seen this or aren't, aren't um, zooming in, these are different, um, these are different uh, versions, or I guess the same version of your artist statement, they've just been dealt with materially in a, in a wide range of ways. And then um, this is how it's displayed. Um, and um, maybe I think, Marcy, if you can go to the next slide, oh, have, a couple of things a little closer. Okay, so here's a little closer up. What I appreciate about this is, um, is you know, the artist statement, is, it, it is sort of a vulnerable space, you explaining what the work is. Um, it's something you're very good at, um, but I like how it's, um, you know, as we're talking about, you know, a craft process, a making process with glass, you know, it's, you're often like trying these different iterations, these slight different approaches to develop, you know, exactly what you want to see. So I, I see this parallel, parallel there, um, but, um, but I'm more interested in sort of pulling the writing away from it because you are such a um, prolific writer. And um, I, uh, and I think this is just kind of really a good example of where the two um, intersect in your work, but, um, you know, how do you, uh, as, as um, you know, as a craft maker of glass objects and, and other things, but, um, and as a crafts person in terms of the written word, where are, you know, you can elaborate, hopefully you can elaborate a little bit more about um, where you see that intersection, where you see the influence back and forth between those two places. Maybe this not being the perfect example, perhaps a surprising example along the way. Yeah, I um, I was I, I this piece delights me that you pulled this one up because it's such a snoozer. Like it's it's one of the things that's kind of like lived online as like a you know a thing that I've been so excited about, but I've never really put out in public, not for any good reason. It's just that nobody wants to have it. Uh, but I, I, I love. I, I think you know. I'm, I, glad, I, I'm glad to give it some light. Yeah, I'll, I'll ship it to you. <laughs> um. I can talk about the specifics of this piece later on, but I do like, um, you know, the word craft is one that I actually really, really love. It's uh, it's a word that I am a huge fan of. I think it's, uh, as someone who kind of identifies with the underdog, I, I feel like it's an underrated term uh, in, in specifically the glass field. Um, no matter how abstract any one of our thinking or our or practices are, I do see its presence as a very, highly unrecognized component of just simply being at work as a creative practitioner. So uh, craft to me is a lot of things, but I've, I've mostly been focusing in on my relationship to that word lately as being kind of living as a verb, uh, sort of an action word, an action word for, for caring, not only caring about what one does, but in how they do it. So um, the idea of how we can bring an idea to life. And I think that, um, uh, writing and making have always kind of lived as a very similar thing to me. Um, I feel like it's a matter of intention. And one of the things that, you know, I'm not quite sure where it came from. I, I guess to talk about where the two sort of um, parallel for me is that back as an undergrad, we were forced to kind of write a lot. And so um, whether you liked it or not, it was just part of the deal. And I begin to see writing as a tool, uh, kind of like how drawing is a tool. It's, it's not one of any specific kind of things, but it is a way to sort of visualize ideas as things. And I, I kind of saw writing as the same thing. It was a way to give shape to thoughts, you know, in real time, right in front of you, pen to paper, punching the keyboard and whatever you do or however you did it. So writing isn't just like making, I, I feel like writing is making. And so, uh, the fact that what I do as an artist is not that different than what I do as a writer. It's, it's really always been about noticing something that no one else seems to be noticing. 
and then figuring out a way to sort of bring it to light in a way that's um, you know kind of twofold. One one way is you know make sure it's meaningful or informative or enriching or whatever for me, but also accessible to others in a similarly effective way, um, able to have impact on others. Uh, I don't know if all of my writing or all of my making have that kind of effect on a general audience who isn't me, but you know that's that's a, a big propellant for how I go about both of those things. It's not the goal, but it's definitely a goal. And uh, a big part of the job for me, whether working with words or working towards projects, has always been to make sure that whatever it is I'm trying to tackle, I want to make sure that it matters to myself first before trying to kind of put it out in the world and persuade someone else that it may matter to them too. So, you know, that's where that question about craft comes back in with that sort of writing making sort of paradigm. I think that um, I think that for things to matter is to say that there is some sort of underlying but overwhelming sense of importance to whatever it is that we're kind of devoting our time and energy to. And so that's that's kind of where both of those worlds kind of live not only separately, but that's kind of collectively um, kind of how they sort of inform me about what the other one's all about. When you, so, you know, some of your writing is um, um, your participation with Gas News, where you are, um, where you're doing reviews of different folks' works, you're talking about issues within the field. Um, some of the writing is writing statements for, for your own work. Um, you know, you also have and maybe Marcy, you can go to, there's another slide, which is, um, we'll shout out your blog here. Well, this is great. Leave it here for a second, Marcy. This is, um, I, I think this is new. I, I haven't seen this resolved as a full project yet, but I think you're calling this yeah. ambigram. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, these, these kind of um, deflated objects have, have been parts of uh, several recent projects. But I like that that now they're materialized as um, actual, imagined as actual letters in a, in a you know, very brief poem or something. I don't, you want to talk about this at all? Yeah. So this is um, this is uh, kind of where uh, I've been using like social media platforms as a sort of digital sketchbook in a few different ways, and. Um, being that I work here at a university, I have really cool neighbors and um, they kind of seem to be interested in, in kind of doing, going down some very bizarre roads with me where we can kind of merge expertise. And um, in, in this case, you know, somebody was um, very kind, uh, professor named Ted Kinsman in photo was very kind to kind of uh, work with me and figuring out some really luscious photograms of various uh, <laughs> various uh, cups uh, in in limbo and um, and you know they were cool images and I'm starting to kind of think about how um, how that might be good enough for me you know I've been working hard for a long time and and every project's been so time consuming and so laborious and you know I think that that's fine and good but I'm at a point in my life in my career where I'm like that's cool but what about what about balancing that with sort of less rigorous, time-consuming uh, sort of projects that are a little bit more, you know, not not working hard versus working smart, but maybe working clever. And so this is just an attempt to kind of merge that interest in making and language in a way that might develop some sort of. Um, I love wordplay and I love like word phenomenon. So like things like palindromes are are of interest to me and what I do and how I think about formats and layouts of things. Uh, but also this is a, an ambigram is also one of those things. And uh, so it's all about symmetry, right? Which is also a very glassy term to use in, as a vessel maker. And so the idea of symmetry within a very sort of asymmetrical kind of scenario or situation, it's almost like, you know, the hands being pretty much the same thing, but they're, but they're not, they're kind of superimposed. So they don't really line up the same way when you layer them right over left. And I think ambigrams are kind of the similar sort of way um, or at least mirrored ambigrams. And so that's, that's, you know, getting a little nerdy about certain kinds of things I'm interested in, but that's just it. That's just me kind of playing around with uh, some sort of fictitious alphabet that doesn't exist, maybe shouldn't exist, but how it might, um, how it might speak to, to, to something that's kind of beyond my intent, uh, just kind of rolling the dice and trying to 
play around with stuff and just see what it has to say. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think that, um, you know, you're coming back and you're applying a, you know, a mode of display, a, a mode of uh, formatting it so it, it becomes something else. And that that does kind of parallel the the written statement, the context, you know, the way the way you handle it uh, visually, the way you the way you just the you know this was these are this is a s scrolled through on Instagram, so you know I kind of combine these together to see what they look like drawn out. So you know maybe we collaborated a little bit here, but um, <laughs> but you know it's um, this becomes. I don't know. I, I see. I see this in relationship to withdrawals. You know, uh, there is a statement here, but it's obscured, and um, and I kind of like that. Maybe Marcy, you just go to the next slide. Um, we'll we'll get your shout out to um, and people who haven't read through this. There's um, there's there's wonderful wonderful things in here, and and what I really appreciate about it too is you put um, I guess unedited versions of some of the things that have ended up being published and. And a little extra insight into your um, working process, your writing process, and I think that's in my next question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of stop there, um, unless you want to talk more about um, your your blog, which everybody should check out. Um, I'll I'll talk. Uh, you know, I don't have much to say, but I you know I think it's kind of interesting. It's um, it's been a sort of like uh, yeah, an interesting place that I've had since 2010, but. Um, uh, I don't know what to, to call it. It's it's really more of like a, it served a few different purposes. It, it has kind of served as a place to uh, place unedited um, versions, not unedited as in like, it's just so raw and um, uh, raunchy. It's, it's like, it's just, you know, I have word count issues. <laughs> and so obviously when you work for publication, there's just a lot of, of surgery that goes on and it's just gotta happen, I, I get it. but. The blog has been a place for the unedited full length version of those things to live. Um, but it's also been another place for me to just kind of post different musings. Uh, and it's not necessarily something I advertise. It, I mean, I, I do obviously, it's in my, my bio or whatever, but um, yeah, it's kind of like this, uh, it's kind of like this, um, this, this makers slash educators diary of perspective along the way that's sort of hidden in plain sight. So I get comfort in knowing that it's out there, but I, I don't really know if it's getting a lot of um, visitation and I'm very okay with either way. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get back to that uh, okay. in, the, in the next round, but um, I think, I think you, you've got something for me before that. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, this is gonna be a snippet of a larger kind of visual in just a second. So um, uh, I, I, I really love this work. This, I, I kind of echo a thing that you had mentioned earlier. Like, I, I know that um, this is the thing that I wish I thought of and I wish I'd made. Uh, I just think that the thinking is just so smart in such a clever way. And uh, it has a lot to do with my interest in obsessive tendencies that are kind of used for good. And um, I know that uh, repetition and redundancy are, are creative tools that both of us use from time to time. And this is a really great example of like uh, a way in which it really does that in a very overwhelmingly visual way. Um, here's, here's the piece in full. Yeah, look at that. That's so great. And it also, you know, it highlights a few different things. It also highlights my, my interest in how you sort of, um, engage variations on a theme and that whole um, that that in terms of like what is what content is filling these forms and what kind of content is filling this kind of form and how the arrangement uh, kind of speaks to the, that interest in sort of like not only yeah there's also like uh, there, there's like a, a spectrum of its own like a, a tonal spectrum there's some color in here as well but uh, Anyway, the repetition is what I'm mostly kind of interested in here. Um, I was wondering what ways do you rely on this notion of the reiterative in your current thinking and making? Um, I feel like I've seen it a few different ways and I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but I think it exists in another way, in another body of work that I really love uh, called Echo. Um, so I was I was kind of wondering how your your relationship to repetition 
has um, changed over time. This this work is I don't want to say it's old, but it's it, I, I don't know if he would call it recent, but it's it's certainly in the canon of David King's work that I feel is just really important to me. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to repetition. Do you have any kind of sense on how it's changed or where it might be going? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, I think there's comfort in that. There's comfort in the routine and the ritual, and um, but there is um, there's something lost if uh, if you don't find uh, you know th this is one of those cases where you know the greatest creative creativity is found within some set of limitations, which is, is a similar thing I think we found in that piece with Charles, with you, with the, the artist statements. Mm -hmm. It's like you sort of had this, you, you had this line of inquiry, you had this prompt that you gave yourself. And then um, it's just then it's seeing how many different ways you can accomplish it. Um, so I think absolutely that, that, that satisfies um, sort of a desire, not only to blow glass, but to kind of like, you know, to um, to take inventory uh, on on things around. This is this is a uh, and some versions of whatever this became, I would call it a self portrait because these are these are things that you know were either in my environment or that I um, I you know uh, produced in some way um, because of because of decisions I was making in my life. Um, so, you know, it feels, it feels very intimate. It feels, it feels like a strange combination of being like uh, vulnerable, but also, you know, very much in control. It's sort of like, okay, uh, we're gonna bottle it up. I mean, there's, there's, mm -hmm. some, there's some little literal idioms we can apply to this. Um, but, um, but in terms of the, re the reiterative, um, I think you know it's it's probably more of a character trait that led me to glass blowing, and if not that, you know maybe it would have been pottery or it would have been you know painting abstract squares over and over and over again. Um, and now it's you know uh, cutting very special boxes for special little pieces of plastic. Um, so so yeah, um, in terms of. Um, you know, again, I think it's a conversation about intention versus intuition. And um, I, I probably would cop to saying it's more, it was more intuition and then f figuring out that I had something um, that was sort of doing something altogether in terms of it becoming a spectrum, in terms of it becoming a series of things as opposed to um, a convenience of storage. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't really a convenience of storage. Um, it's never been. One of the things that I really love about um, uh, kind of observing it online uh, when I go to your website and uh, when I went and like just screenshot every few to put together in this way, have you ever, it's almost like what you asked me about that funky ambigram. Uh, have you ever seen, have you ever seen all of those kind of images lined up? Have you ever seen the piece kind of live in this, in this sort of format where everything's kind of lined up? Uh, yeah, I put it together a couple times. Um, the first time it was on a very high shelf in a gallery space. Um, sometimes some, some, sometimes some natural light coming through it. Sometimes not. Um, and um, and it's been in a couple different spaces. And um, but this is lovely. I, I figured you did this digitally. I was, I was like I, I put together a show card with some of these before. So um, so no, it is. It's 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 a it's it's a very generous gesture for, for you to do to um to sort of bring these together. And I think I think that's some of the fun of it. You know, it becomes, um, you know, uh, you know, I want this work to be taken seriously. To, you know, to to those who who want to put that effort in, in in terms of saying, you know, this is a record of somebody's existence. This is this is a, a self portrait of sorts. It is this um, absurd production line of, of activities that are are irrelevant to probably anybody but me. But I want I want people to to look at this and be like that one's a little bit out of place. Like no, like I would have put this one before that one. And so it is. It's a little bit of a perception test. Um, and my hope is that all of those things can kind of communicate with one another. That that ultimately it's something that you're. Um, 
you're kind of wondering why in the world would you take that on, but but then get kind of excited by the invitation to do something as um as um, uh, sort of absurd and um, and uh, but but hopefully playful and inviting in its in its own way. Which is another it's another duality that I really appreciate about you too is that place where being super serious about something that's kind of really unimportant, but um, it -hmm. seems to to jar something loose that's worth visiting and dwelling in intellectually, emotionally. I think that that's one of the things that I really appreciate about a lot of your work. And this this one really kind of, um, I really connected with this one in that way. And even like the idea of like clicking to the right to kind of like walk digitally with it to the end and you know it takes a while to get there and so watching the screen change from you know the, the sort of spectrum that you're putting putting there with the, the black to the brown to the khaki to the semi vanilla you know it's just it's such a wonderful experience to to kind of uh, kind of trick people in in kind of appreciating redundancy uh in a way that is anything but yeah yeah um uh, no, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, what it makes me think about is what I, you know, all artists, uh, you know, uh, no matter what, right? Um, even the most sort of eccentric of of them, of us, you know, will end up sort of, you know, making some sort of series or making work that that relies on the previous work to to contextualize it, and vice versa, right? And um, and I think. Um, you know, you think about your favorite musician and it's like, oh, it kind of sounds like that, that last hit, but, but not enough. I don't like it. Or, or I'm really excited by the, you know, the variation on the theme that has happened here. So yes, I think, I think probably mostly um, these are really, really boring objects, but they become a lot more exciting in relationship to the group. And I think, you know, you know, this will be my last point here, uh, but, but that's the metaphor that I think I find really exciting is like the mundane, um, every every mundane inclusion um, is a standout in its own way, um, you know, for a different person maybe, you know, so. Yeah, I love that piece. The one thing that I wanted to mention while it was up, but I, I know that we got to move on because uh, time is really moving here. Um, uh, but I also love the sort of like brief descriptors of the content or the way in which the bottle's been kind of um, addressed, whether uh, in, in whatever way you did. Um, but I, 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 I don't know if you know this, but I, I, I've purchased a very large bottle that you've created um, and a smaller one that accompanies it. And my partner, Rebecca Arday and I, um, when we bought it, we made the decision to sort of kind of follow the spirit of that idea. And we put all of our loose change over time in the, the big bottle and that was gonna be our vacation fund. So I, I don't know where we're at. It's not very full. It's a big bottle. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that we're, uh, <laughs> we're putting on the, the spirit of David King and, and filling our own with with coins. Oh, good. No, that, that makes me happy to hear that that's still kicking around. And, um, and yeah, the the filling process, it seems it seems, you know, simple and straightforward, but but that's maybe where most of the la labor lies is, you know, stuffing that thing full of something. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to my next round of questions, to David, which I start with this image. And you brought this up a little bit in your intro, and I appreciated that you did. Um, and um, this is one scene from a larger work that that's defined, I think, of, again, a couple different ways, but, but let's call this survey. And um, and I started sort of watching this happen on um, on Instagram at first, I think um, at least that's where I became familiar with it. Um, and this would happen maybe about midday Sunday and, you know, end of the blow slot Sunday. The fun is within the journey, I think, is maybe a tagline you put on it, too. This is how um, it's sort of presented. Um, and you and you mentioned in the intro to ongoing. Um, I'm kind of curious what's in the frame uh, in the statement that accompanies it. It looks like it's an official piece of document. Um, but anyway, let me get to a bit of a question first. Maybe you can come back to that. Um, 
But, you know, what you do, um, and again, this is like an iterative process, a reiterative process. So I, 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 sh I share your interest there. Obviously, you know, I often blow glass on Sundays, have this similar experience as an educator. You kind of get this one day of the week to, um, to make your work. And, um, and that pile of broken glass on the floor is a real metric of that. Um, but your other metric, which I'm kind of curious about in this, in this question, is that you know you are sharing this with all of us as you go along, and these things materialize eventually into bigger projects. Marcy, I think we actually we could go to the next slide. Um, and here's a, another good example of something we watched come together: um, uh, polymerous geometry. And um, and I love this process photo because it's such a glass blower's way of of working in the kiln. Like, let's put a big steel pipe in there and paint kiln wash on it. You know, and then the next the next uh, slide, Marcy, and here you'll see them, them documented officially. But same thing, we kind of have you know, in one way these things coming together, another way the residue of these things coming apart, or um, or the the you know the, the residue of the process. Sometimes it's things that just didn't work out. But in both cases, you're kind of bringing us along with it, and I'm just curious about like. Um, you know, I don't have that same instinct. Mm. I'm wondering about that instinct. I'm wondering about um, whether you get feedback as you move through these projects, if that affects the decisions you're making um, um, and how, you know, how are you comfortable with that? Um, uh, and how do I become more comfortable to <laughs> sharing your secrets? Um. Yeah, I, I'm a late bloomer to the social media thing. And I, I you know, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, it is a, a difficult thing. I'm a, I'm a very private person. And so um, coming around to thinking about how it might be useful to someone like me uh, is something I'm still trying to figure out. But I, I've kind of landed on, on kind of using it as, as I mentioned before, it's almost like a, it's like a, a, a creative play thing for me. I think that um, uh, it, it's really become many things the way that I use it. Uh, it's, it's become a sketchbook to play with imagery. Um, it's become like through those funky filters and layout options um, and thinking about those as formal properties, but just in a digital format. I, I also think about using social media as a sketchbook to play like with the words and the captioning. It's just a sort of like troubleshoot ideas and um, sometimes you know you go for a, a really long complicated thing and sometimes you go for a short brief thing it's really just like it's not that different than like a comic going to like the local funny bone and, and trying new material out to people that um, yeah there's not a lot of investment in, in figuring out what's working and what's not I don't really get a lot of like reply. So I don't, I don't feel like um, there's a lot of burden or weight on, on moving things ahead, but um, uh, it does give me a moment to sort of document process in real time. And it gives me a moment to um, kind of do that in a way that um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know what my thinking is. It lives as like documenting process and progress, yes, but sometimes it's like a fun little way of creating a little sort of, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? A sort of like, um, like that, that uh, end of slot survey sort of hashtag thing, a, a little mm -hmm. funky creative campaign, not for any purpose, but just to like kind of see an idea through time and to be able to kind of use it as like a, like a journal that one can kind of archive things with the proper sort of hashtagging or, or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. I see it as a lot of different things, but also as a, an educator and a full-time faculty member at university, I also see it, you know, as a way to um, indicate to my superiors here at RIT that I'm, I'm busy. I'm, I'm trying to be busy and uh, a way to sort of maybe uh, use it as a recruitment tool indirectly, you know, maybe prospective students see things um, and get excited about it and it prompts them to think about applying or maybe it maybe it informs students who are already here whether they're majors or not and maybe it sort of jars something loose in their thinking or their approach to whatever I don't know um, these are just a lot of random thoughts and how it's a sort of a multi-purposeful thing and so um, uh, you know I I understand it's a very superficial kind of like 
this is this is me putting myself out in a very public way. And I, I don't know about you, but you know, I grew up in a household where it just wasn't polite to talk about yourself. So the whole notion of like really putting your, your business out there, even in like really fun social media ways was a real difficult pill to swallow. And it still is, but you know, I am starting to kind of buy into the superficiality of it, but trying to like think about that in some sort of to do it with integrity, I guess, is what I'm trying to do and trying to be pers purposeful with it instead of sort of, um, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm trying to say here, but it seems to serve many different purposes. And I, I think that um, to think about notions of vulnerability and courage, I think that like the asynchronicity of it gives me a sort of place of safety and shelter. I know that it isn't an anonymous experience, but it, it's distant enough for me from a digital viewing public that almost feels like it is, you know, especially as a super private person, there's this sort of out of sight, out of mind kind of quality to being digitally public for me. So, um, and, you know, I, as long as I have control of what's put out and how I, it just seems to, um, uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I kind of see it as a, a fruitful creative tool in a variety of different ways. And, um, yeah, I take any sort of responses, whether through likes or through any sort of textual uh, sort of submissions. I don't, I, you know, I take all things with a grain of salt. I don't really kind of uh, build an, an, an ego with it or, or have an ego crushed because of it. So it's, it's entirely just a, it's just a digital sketchbook slash journal for me. That's good to know. I mean, I, I do think it functions in, in, a, in a lot of different ways. Um, I think it does build a level of investment. So, you know, I feel more invested in these projects. Mm -hmm. Marcy, maybe you can go to, I think there's one more slide that shows, yeah, some detail of, of that work. I mean, you know, when I think about like the experience of going along with you with this piece, it was like before these were documented, it was like, I kind of saw what you're up to. It's like, oh, okay. He's like fusing these things together. Like, I know what the objects are. I've seen the objects. So, you know, I guess what, um, like I like these objects. I think it's curious. I they, they're I haven't seen them in person, but you know the documentation is beautiful. The, I think the idea of it is is really elegant. Um, um, but it's again, it's like it's this investment that um, that I've seen. That if you weren't vulnerable and open and open to sharing it, you know, I've seen these objects. I've seen the process of you trying to put them together. So then it's um it's kind of even more exciting when you um see it come to fruition. And then the other thing I find curious is this is a piece on your website that has no statement along with it, um, which you don't have to address, but um, that seems like a bit of an anomaly as well. Yeah, so a couple thoughts came to mind as you were talking to kind of hit up that last point you made. Um, uh, that, that whole sort of like square format has really sort of infiltrated um, the way I format a lot of like the formal properties of work when I resolve certain things. Uh, for for exhibition purposes, uh, or in terms of thinking about proportional sort of sensibilities, for whatever reason, uh, I you know it's really funny how that sort of square um, motif has has kind of um, it's it's kind of become this subconscious sort of uh, prompt in in various ways in which I format stuff. So that's that's one thing that I think about when I see this image and hear what you had just mentioned. Um, but the other thought I had too, when you were talking about kind of following along on the um, on the sort of you know, for lack of a better word, the journey of of, of an artwork, I feel like um, if anybody knows the David Schnuckel of about 15 years ago, it was a very uh, he was a very narrative driven kind of artist, glass person. It was always been imagery and text like kind of applied upon a vessel surface as some sort of way of abstracting a sort of method of storytelling. And I think that um, even though that's not necessarily part of who I am or what I do now, perhaps that's also a way in which I see certain ways in which I kind of approach that sort of like uh, posting scenario or that social media paradigm is that maybe there is a, a method of narrative here that I'm kind of, um, kind of reacting to that's still kind of there. Uh, even though it's not obviously, I'm just kind of realizing it for the first time right now. Um, it's not a conscious decision, but perhaps that might be one of my own sort of um, uh, artist, uh, you know, DNA fingerprints that just sort of happened to kind of bleed out from time to time, and I didn't even know it. 
Yeah, no, I think it, I think it definitely is. Um, I think it definitely is, uh, you, you know, I see that, I, you know, I see that reflecting in myself, but I, I see that in looking at your work and, I, and identifying with it. And also like, um, you, you know, the things I'm envious of is I, so I'm like, yeah, you know, there, there are these, there's these distinct things that are David Schnuckel. And, um, and I like that, that you came back around to the narrative, like, um, mm. yeah, you, you want, you want to give us a complete, complete story. Yours just happens to be shaped like a square and mine is shaped like a circle. Yeah. I've noticed so, that too. Yeah. 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 That has not yeah been lost on me, which I think is a cool kind of, it not, not a disconnect, but that might be kind of a, a really interesting deviation where we share similarities that kind of don't really line up in the same way. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, so what do you think? Uh, do, do we move to our next round of questions or? I'm up for it if you are, David. If, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think we, let, let, let's do a lightning round, okay? Okay. Yeah, so this piece is called Echo. Uh, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's, um, it's another really, really cool idea that sort of captures a lot of uh, my own tendencies for things like obsession and attention to detail and thinking about abstracted ways in which the vessel is in service, uh, not only the glass component, but also like the, the things that are being sort of commemorated inside. And so I guess, um, what do I wanna ask about this? I think, I think this might be a question about, there's, yeah, du dualities, uh, thinking about, uh, thinking about the fact that we nourish practices that dwell in a space where futility seem like uselessness seems conceptually useful and that we both sort of activate, you know, an impractical or an unreasonable approach to making and thinking with a very serious and very dedicated application of our skill and our time and our effort. So, um, yeah, would you agree that these are dualities that seem to run consistent from project to project for you? Maybe not in the same way as here, but um, maybe in their own way from, from all the various ways in which you've kind of brought to life all the work that you brought to life. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do think that's the case. And I, and I think, um, you know, I can reflect that question right, right back at you, but may, maybe I'll give you a second and just say that, um, you know, maybe this is part of my question back to you a little bit is um, I'm always surprised because I think, you know, I thought that this, the blue object in the top right was kind of the first of this series that I put together. And, um, you know, I thought it was completely different and, 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 and you know, in a way it, it, it was, but, um, but I think it does share that, um, you know, it had to be really hard. It, I had to figure out something. It had to be this kind of puzzle that I had to solve. And, um, but then in the end, it had to be so simple and so, you know, stupid in a way <laughs> that, um, that anybody would get it and that anybody could appreciate it. Um, but also um, kind of done well enough that it wasn't all about the effort it took to, to have it happen. Um, uh, you know, had some sense of, of being effortless. Mm. Um, uh, like it just belonged there. Um, so I think that addresses the duality a little bit is like, you know, this was really hard to do, but, um, but at the upfront, um, there's kind of a decision made, um, and, um, and maybe we'll bring up some of the images that I had for you up last two and here in a second, because, you know, it has this, you know, I think my last question for you as well, um, you know, is kind of about like, um, you know, it's different, but it, but it's sort of about like, you know, do you know exactly what's going to happen with whatever experiment you're taking on? Or is it, or is it this kind of discovery? So um, I think it, again, it's a little intuitive, but it, it um, but it seems to happen if I if I pay the right attention to it. Yeah, um, I think that um, 
I don't normally know when things are done. Um, usually a deadline <laughs> kind of tells me when I'm done for the moment. Uh, but I'll always have some thoughts for modification or revision when I get a work back to me afterwards. So, um, and, and quite honestly, I think that maybe that's something that we share, but I know that in my case, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of approaching uh, an art making practice that allows for me to be able to do that. I can kind of get something back and, and tweak it and, and modify it and, and revise it. I can take, take this data off the bulletin board that I'm using in this installation and put new data on for whatever reason. You know, I, it's interchangeable in a lot of ways. And um, a lot of times an idea for me starts as a sort of study or observance, and then I try to find something artful within it. Um, and then try and tie that together with um, broader talking points in terms of like compromise or risk or abandon or surrender or, or whatever it is that's sort of um, kind of uh, prompting whatever sort of uh, material wrongness or glass object wrongness I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, so you kind of have a word in mind when you start. You, you, it's, for you, it seems like it hinges quite a bit around language. It's beginning to even more right yeah. now. And so it's interesting to be working on things that sort of live, I wouldn't say in a previous state of mind, but the sort of work that you pulled up that were sort of more image-based and just kind of strictly image-based, like that sort of glass kind of alphabet, that funky glass alphabet, mm -hmm. that's really allowing me to think about it in a much more sort of direct way with less sort of like, you know, supplemental bullshit. <laughs> around like you know I don't have the framed photograph and the video and the sound file and the blah 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 and the the, the, the correspondence frame you know so it's it's making me think about it in a much more simplistic way um, but I should confess that the work that I do that has lived mostly in this sort of pseudo observational kind of way is pretty much a one-time deal in documenting whatever compromising situation that I'm kind of looking at uh, whatever I'm trying to capture. And so I try to make the most out of those files, whether they're images or video. And I'm starting to dabble in sound and how those things are sort of translating as glass-based sound sort of experiences. Um, they're not anywhere ready for, for me to kind of put on the world. But um, yeah, so yeah, I'm not necessarily sure I know when a thing is done and I can modify it quite a bit unless it's like living in that sort of um, kind of singular art object kind of format like the polymerous geometry objects are. Yeah, you know, that did. I, and maybe what Marcy's bringing up is some some of those images. Um, you know, yeah, like like this work, which um, which, you know, I can I can relate to again, you know, this this various ways of looking at a project, uh, contextualizing it historically, um, you know, both the photograph and the object and the drawing and um but maybe go to the next this is uh how do you say that that this word david how do you pronounce that it's either decadal or decadal there's a couple different pronunciations okay. yeah um but you know it's like within this i mean this is maybe this is related to that thing i was talking about a little bit is like this looks like this is complete chance and happenstance and it is to some degree but it's also you like honing in on a pretty precise understanding of what these objects do and capturing this moment that you know is is really beautiful or that's what i'm that's what i'm expecting and you know maybe this idea of it you know it looks it looks effortless in a sense but there's there's an awful lot of planning and um and after product work on this as well. An awful lot of planning it's funny that something so seemingly straightforward as documenting like 10 <laughs> 10 goblets in motion it's it's um and I, I think that that's part of what i like to do too that that reminds me of some of what i asked you about like the utility and, and that, that that duality between usefulness and uselessness and like um uh there's so much work that goes into just setting up like that top image uh i mean i have templates i have notes where things go which part of the foot is is on the west side of the table or facing the west side of the table every time where the camera's hanging out the angle of it how tall the stand is like everything's like so mapped out and this this project in particular you know it was really about kind of seeing the activity of what's going on inside a kiln when these things are kind of subjected to temperatures that they just obviously can't withstand but it was before i had made friends at um with with uh, folks down at Corning 
Museum of Glass at the studio there and Corning Incorporated to actually film what's going on. But, um, you know, the idea of sort of a, a sort of um, uh, time lapse of how things are moving in a kiln, just kind of slightly slumping them little by little. I only have 10 of those images here, but I think it, it I don't know, there's maybe 16 or 17 before they're like totally like at rest. Um, and, and yeah, so this really simple project took uh, almost a, a little over a year and a half just for the photography alone. So um, yeah, there's some, there's some funky sort of um, uh, so, some rigor, some, some bizarre rigor at play in these like super silly kind of observational efforts. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, how, how do you understand irony in relationship to what you're up to? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I understand it, but I mean, there is, uh, there is, you know, even though I'm trying to put a suit and tie on stuff, it, it is sort of prompted by a little tongue in cheek to begin with. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can't put my finger on it in this moment, but, um, but I, irony is a big part of, of what I'm interested in. Uh, it always has been. Um, and I know that as an artist, it's always kind of been sort of a component uh, that I've, I've often kind of used either as some sort of like muse or prompt or some sort of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, but I know it's always been there. And it's always been a thing that I, I, I really delight in. I love engaging artwork that also kind of dwells in it. And I love recognizing when artists like you kind of embrace a relationship with it in your own way that kind of feeds into how I might begin to think or how differently I can think about how I'm doing what I'm doing because we do have these shared tendencies, but they're just manifested in such different ways. Uh, yeah, um, I don't think I can, I don't think I can kind of articulate that, that answer very well. No, I, th I think you did okay. I mean, you know, I was hoping that you with your um, with your advanced vocabulary and um, you know writerly uh, style could could maybe even just define the word. So I'm not quite sure what it means, but I kind of feel like it does have some in the ways in which what I do has been interpreted. I think slightly incorrectly is like maybe ironies. Um, relationship to cynicism mm. versus uh, sincerity. And, uh, and, and, you know, and I see this in you too. I mean, I, what I do is, is incredibly sincere, mm. um, but it's, but it exists in a time filled with cynicism. Mm. So it's, it's, I think it's using kind of a, um, I think, um, you know, it's it, it's hard to define because it's just like it's it's the water. It's just the water we're in. Mm. Um, it's it's shorthand and it's um, and it's uh, it's more entertaining than than sort of uh, naked, vulnerable sincerity. Sincerity. Yeah, maybe one last thought here might be that it has something to do with um, kind of this intersection between tension and harmony. Perhaps that's what it is for me. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. It took some time, but I got there. Good. Well, we're probably at the point where, um, you know, uh, you all were supposed to ask us questions long ago, but we're happy to take some if there still are some. We're Thank you, hand back guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we do have a couple questions, so I'll pose those and then we'll wrap up. The first question comes from Dr. Jane. Can you both talk about what interactive or performative experiences bring to you? Thinking of Flock the Optic and Glassography. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I'll take it, David. Um, <laughs> at first, um, it's absolutely everything. Yeah, I think, I think good point, Jane. Um, uh, I think we bypassed that you know, um, a love for the material for me is also a love of the community. Um, and maybe it's a good place to thank again Wheaton, which is an amazing community and a place where, where once I um, sort of entered the door, felt, felt that energy as powerful as any place. Um, but I think, um, you know, this other project I'm involved with, Flock the Optic, is very much about um, participating with folks from all over the world, really. Um, 
but but inviting others in to to express their creative energy as um, sort of freely and lightly and um, and absurdly as as they desire and um, kind of just providing the the playground for that um, and um, and and that's incredibly important I think it's how I how I personally connect to the world is through the glass community through through things like this um, you know meeting folks like um, like you all um, you know David and, and some of the folks who are there in the still on the chat um, so you know um, participation is just it's an invitation into um, into uh, uh, relationships that are that are um, incredibly productive and um, fulfilling as simple as that yeah and for me if I were to just kind of put it real briefly or try to put it very briefly I think that um, in, in my case of facilitating some sort of uh, communal experience uh, with with people of shared interest in either glass and or words um, I think that for me uh, my story changes when I know yours and so the notion of a sort of uh, a sort of collective effort to kind of better understand who we are and how we operate not just as creative people but human beings with others that kind of have shared interests in, in, in whatever it is that we're sharing interest in in that moment. And so glassography was a great way to do that under the sort of guise of a summer workshop um, and, and to do it in a, a really special place um, that has been built on the notion of community and sharing. And so to, to kind of honor the cornerstones of what the Studio Glass Movement has been essentially built on uh, in that way, through words and writing and conversation and just examining this glass thing, not, not just making it, not just it as a material, but it is a culture, it is a field, it is a teaching tool, uh, and, and a whole host of other things. I think that um, that's where the value of that sort of interactive component of glassography had been for me, and that's what I hope others took away from it too. Yeah, and I can say that that was definitely the case. I, I'm a glassographer, and it was a really uh, special experience, and, and I uh, hope it may continue. Thank you. Our next question is from Noella Lampy, and this is for David King. Do you plan to revisit the Zoetropes to C++ project in the future? Um, yeah, uh, thanks, thanks Noelle, and it's nice to, nice to speak to you, or thanks for the question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but potentially, uh, there's an opportunity for me coming up. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much I should or can talk about it, but I'm, uh, the invitation involves a little bit of revisiting some more of the optical, um, sort of playful pieces, and it may be a reworking of some of them. It may be a, a presentation of them as they stand coming out of storage, but, um, but yeah, you know, I think there's, there's sort of an object paste based practice and then there's this other um, sort of more kinetic um, based practice and um, and those things take a little bit long it all takes longer to develop but um, but I do have some things kicking around and I'm hoping that um, a surprising version of some of those um, some of those optical pieces will um, make a return at some point. Fantastic well thank you both so much for being here with us tonight it was a pleasure to hear you talking back and forth and just coming up with some and working through some really interesting concepts. So thank you. Our pleasure. Yes, very much my pleasure being here. And thanks, thanks to you and thanks to David. I, I learned a lot. Thanks from me as well. And thank you for to our audience for being with us this evening. And here's Pamela's information. Always a pleasure to work with you, Pamela. And um, you can learn more at wheatonarts.org. And thank you for joining us tonight. If you have any suggestions about the content that you want to see coming upcoming and so forth, so feel, please feel free to drop us a line. And again, thank you both for being with us. And thank you all. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night.